Choosing the right motherboard if you're a gamer is not always the easiest thing to do, and finding the right board if you're a content creator can be even harder. MSI is trying to make that selection a little bit easier with the MEG X299 creation board. But is this the right choice for content creators, and should you buy one? Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and if you hear some wind noises outside, We've got like 40 mile an hour wind gusts and we're supposed to be getting about three inches of rain like tonight. So bear with me and hope my lights stay on. As I said in the intro, today we're going to be taking a look at MSI's new MEG X299 Creation Motherboard. I put this board into a build a couple weeks ago as part of my Fractal Design Meshify S2 review. And if you want to see that build, the link will be, well, right up here. Let's start by going over the specs. This is a Socket 2066 motherboard and supports Intel 7th and 9th gen high-end desktop CPUs. There are eight DIMM slots for quad-channel DDR4 memory with support for up to 128 gigabytes of capacity and 4200 megahertz speeds. There's also four full-length PCIe X16 slots with two of them running at X16 and the other two running at X8, along with a single X1 slot near the bottom of the board. But that's all standard fare for X299 motherboards. What makes this one better for creators? Great question, I'm glad you asked. Well, we'll start with the easy answer and that starts with this little expansion card right here. This is a two port Thunderbolt 3 card included in the box. While I can't imagine anyone needing to run external PCIe cards off of this, the need for portable high-speed storage is real, especially for video editors. The ability to ingest footage or dump projects onto Thunderbolt drives at 40 gigabit speeds is definitely going to draw a lot of interest. There's also two DisplayPort in ports on this card, meaning you can actually pass through the video to your Thunderbolt devices. So if you've got monitors or other devices that accept DisplayPort video, you're ready to rock. Since I mentioned high-speed storage, that's the other party trick of the Creation motherboard. If you need metric tons of high-speed storage and the eight SATA ports just aren't fast enough for you, you're typically stuck with at best one or two M.2 NVMe slots. Not so on the Creation board. There's not one, not two, but three NVMe slots on this board, two of which support the longer 22110 length drives. There's also a U.2 drive port for NVMe based 2.5 inch SSDs. What, you're still not impressed? How much NVMe storage do you need? Okay, okay, tell you what. How about if they allow bifurcation of an X16 PCIe slot and include an expansion card to allow an additional four M.2 NVMe drives to connect all at X4 speeds? Would you be happy with a total of seven M.2 slots? So on top of the Thunderbolt expandability and seven NVMe ports, this is also a top flight X299 motherboard with a 14 phase power delivery and three eight pin EPS headers. So running any chip overclocked up to the 9980XE should be no problem at all. Other features on the Creation Board include built-in AC Wi-Fi and an included antenna, six USB 3.1 Type-A ports along the back, along with a USB 3.1 Type-C. This board is also pretty well loaded for front panel connections as well, including two USB 3.1 Type-A headers and a single 3.1 Type-C header. There are dual LAN connections on the board, one at one gigabit and the other of the 2.5 gigabit variety. While I do appreciate them including faster networking for offloading all of that NVMe storage, I still really would have liked to see them upgrade one of those to a 10 gigabit interface instead. Getting into the looks and construction of the X299 Creative, I am really digging these silver PCB covers, and the splashes of RGB are actually quite tastefully done. The lower cover also acts as a heat shield for the three onboard M.2 slots as well. Now that we've covered the hardware specs, let's go ahead and dive into the BIOS and into the OS and see if there's anything else that might entice a creator to jump this direction. Here is the system running inside my Fractal Design Meshify S2 and looking quite snazzy if I do say so myself. If you haven't seen the build, just to recap, it's running an i7-7820X 8-core CPU along with 32GB of Corsair LPX Vengeance 3200MHz memory. For graphics, I've got an EVGA GTX 1080 for the win card, and for storage, I've got a 480GB Kingston M.2 drive. SATA, unfortunately, it's not an NVMe drive. I didn't have any spare NVMe's when I built this, although I'll probably be swapping out for one in the very near future. But right now, that drive is in that build running Ubuntu, so we'll probably swap it out eventually. Uh, there's also a 1TB 860 EVO SATA drive in here as well. Cooling-wise, I have a Scythe Fumo Revision B, which is a dual 120mm tower cooler, and the fans on the front and the back of the case are the brand new Crown 140 fans from Inwin. And now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the BIOS, which I just realized is actually going to be over here for you, but my monitor's over here. I'm sure you'll figure it out, though. One thing I've always liked about MSI boards is their BIOS are actually very easy to navigate. There's no settings that are buried inside of menus, inside of menus, inside of menus. Everything on here is actually pretty self-explanatory. So from the easy mode, you can see what hardware you have installed, what your memory configuration is, what your storage is, 
how your fans are running, set your fan curves right here, and that's about it. You can also upgrade your BIOS right from here using USB, and you've got all your basic options, so enabling Pixie Boot inside of LAN, as well as enabling some basic overclocking. If we switch on over to the advanced mode, things are actually still pretty straightforward. Motherboard settings is all of your port settings and configurations, your onboard devices, any PCI Express communication, all that kind of stuff is all right here. And the OC section is where you can customize an overclock, which again is pretty straightforward. This is not gonna be a real in-depth or extreme overclocking scenario. I just wanna show you how easy it is to dial in a basic setting. So I'm gonna to go to something like 4.3 or 4.4 and we'll start running with that. So as you can see, I already enabled XMP on this board and that's actually that little button right there. And what that does is that takes your RAM to the rated speed of the memory. So in my case, it's running at 3200 megahertz. And if we go to advanced RAM configuration, here's the timings. It's running at the pre-configured 16, 18, 18, 36. And quite honestly, for my intents and purposes, I'm just gonna leave it there. Now, if I wanted to dial in a manual overclock for my CPU, I actually do that right here at CPU ratio. So let's say I wanted to go to 4.4 gigahertz. I type in 44 and it changes me from 3600 up to 4400 megahertz. If we scroll down a little ways, you'll see our CPU core voltage and this is where we can manually set that as well. However, I think I'm gonna do this one better. I'm gonna let the motherboard set my overclock for me. To have the board set an overclock automatically for me, there's actually a physical dial on the motherboard which you can turn up to 11 if you'd like. It actually goes to 11. But for the sake of this video, I'm not gonna reach around the case and turn that up manually. I can actually turn that to a software-based button by clicking this little button right here. And we're gonna go to number two, which is a 4.5 gigahertz overclock for a 7820X. And all of the overclock numbers for this dial are actually indicated in the user manual. So make sure to check that before you just start spinning that dial. I've actually had this chip tested as high as 5.1 gigahertz, so I know it is a very good chip. The reason I'm going with 4.5 is I honestly don't think the Scythe is going to be able to handle this chip overclocked. It handled it at stock speeds okay, and by okay I mean it was still hitting 90 and 95 pretty regularly, which is way hotter than I like to run my chips. So maybe I'll do an overclocking test on video with this cooler in the next couple of weeks, but uh, for right now we're just going to do a 4.5 overclock on this chip. What I love about this board also is when I go to save, it says make sure that I have at least two of my EPS 12 volt connectors connected and a 1000 watt or higher power supply. Now, I only have an 850 power supply on here, but this is still only an eight core chip with a GTX 1080. This is well within the margin of where I should be running this board. So we're gonna hit okay and we're gonna reboot. Inside of Windows, I'm gonna go ahead and open up hardware monitor and we'll see exactly where this system is running. And just for giggles, let's go ahead and run Cinebench and I think we're gonna wrap this one up. So hit run. You can see us hitting 4.2 gigahertz there on an all core turbo. Uh, not quite what I was expecting out of this, but I'm wondering what our temps are like. Actually, that's not too bad. Hottest core is at 86C. There's 88. Okay, now we're climbing. And 1836, which is not my best score, but it's, uh, it's getting up there, at least with this version of Cinebench. Actually, we're sitting there and leveling off right around 87, 88 degrees. So we've actually got a little bit more headroom to go. Tell you what, let's reboot and let's see if we can dial in a little bit faster overclock. Now, the interesting thing is we're peaking at 4.2 gigahertz. Now, according to my chart, we should be at 4.5. And the 4.3 gigahertz is actually the all-core turbo for the stock speed. So I'm, I'm actually not sure what's going on here. Let's reboot and find out. So, huh, apparently the uh, manual is not quite correct because that only cranked it to 4.2. So I think we're just going to go, let's go to a 6, see what a 6 does. 4.4, okay, Let's see what eight is, okay. Okay, so we went from a two to an eight. Let's see what eight actually is, because two was actually 4.2 gigahertz instead of what it says should be 4.5. All right, we're at 4.5 now, and that's kind of what I wanted from the beginning. All right, now let's give this a test, and this will be our final test. And go. Holding 4.5. Oh yeah, instant throttle, <laughs> 105. Yep, it's throttling all the way down to 3.8 on a couple cores, oof, rough. Rough, rough, rough. 16.55, ouch, ouch. <laughs> so yeah, the Scythe Fumo Revision B. Works at stock speeds, but it's not an overclocker. So there we have it on this very blustery night. I would say all around a great feature set, especially if you need a ton of high-speed storage and Thunderbolt 3 connectivity. 
At $599, though, it's a bit steep to be classified as a gamer motherboard, and I'd attribute the feature set a lot closer to something like a workstation motherboard. And therein lies really my one main criticism of this board. At $599, I'm starting to expect a few more workstation-like features out of it, especially because they're gearing this for content creators doing professional work. Possibly official Xeon and registered ECC memory support along with 10 gigabit ethernet would be a pretty good start. Don't get me wrong though, I think there is still plenty of value in the X299 creation board as it is. It's just positioned in this weird middle ground between high-end gaming and C422 chipset workstation boards. I think if you're a creative professional who needs rock solid stability and a ton of I.O., with just a side of gaming chops and some tasteful RGB lighting, the MSI X299 creation does fill a unique niche in the market, and it definitely gets a recommendation from me. But what do you guys think about it? Does it fill a need either through NVMe storage or Thunderbolt connectivity for you? Let me know down in the comments below. Be sure to like this video if you liked it, or if you disliked it, I guess there's that button too. You're more than welcome to click it. It's fine. Subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already, and follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans. If you're interested in financially backing the channel, make sure to look me up on Patreon, where a minimum donation of $1 a month gets you access to my exclusive Discord server. Chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads, my once-weekly live show every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific for the latest in beer and tech news. If you're interested in picking up any of the hardware that I featured on today's show, make sure to follow the Amazon and now the Newegg affiliate links down in the video description below. It doesn't cost you a thing, and it really does help keep the lights on around here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, and I will see you in... Wait, hold on. I can fix that. In the next video. Cheers, guys. On today's show, we have a new brew from Ninkasi. I actually have never seen this one on store shelves before, so I'm not sure if this is a new release, uh, but it is a seasonal release. This is the Ninkasi from down in Eugene, Oregon, Heart and Science Seasonal Release IPA. It's a 6.8%, uh, I believe 48 IBU, if I remember correctly. Boy, a lot of citrus right up front. Almost like a mandarin orange kind of smell to it. Oh, that's good. A big flavorful IPA with tropical and citrus hop notes, dry hopped and juicy. Heart and Science is brewed as a tribute to the technical arts and heartfelt dedication that brewers, farmers, suppliers, and fans bring to the independent craft brew industry. Like I said, you get that mandarin orange right on your nose. Not getting much else in the, in the nose though. Very, very hoppy, very flavorful hops. And they, they attack you right away. That's a, uh, it's good, <laughs> but uh, you, you really have to be a fan of Northwest IPAs to enjoy this one. It's hoppy without being dank. It's, uh, and obviously it's dry hopped. Um, so you get a lot more of the, that florally and citrusy flavor rather than the, the oils and the clinginess and, and kind of that dankiness that comes on the back end. That's very pleasant. It's very fruity. It's, it's fruity without being overly sweet. It's hop forward without being overly bitter or sour or dank towards the back end. That's very well balanced. I really like that. It's a good summer beer. I don't know why they released it in the winter. This, this to me tastes like a summer beer. But that's all standard fare for X299 motherboards. What makes this one different for creators? Great question, I'm glad you asked. Well, we'll start with the easy answer and that's this handy little expansion card. Of course I need the prop. But that's all standard fare for X299 motherboards. What makes this one different for creators? Great question, I'm glad you asked. Well, we'll start with the easy answer, and that's this handy little expansion card here. It's a, nope, this isn't the Thunderbolt. God dang it. <laughs> nope, not connected to a network. That would be a problem, wouldn't it? If only I had some like Wi-Fi or something like that on here. I do feel a bit like asking if this motherboard is traveling for business or pleasure though, because while it is wearing a short sleeve Hawaiian shirt and shorts at the security desk, it's also got on a tie, black socks, and loafers. Make sure to like this video if you liked it. If you disliked it, there's that button too, and you're more than welcome to click it, although you really shouldn't because you're a bad person. Be sure to like this video if you liked it, or if you disliked it, well, there's that button too, and I guess you're more than welcome to click that one.